Great. Welcome to The New Entrepreneur. Um, we, this is part of our great reopening series. We um, uh, decided to hold a, a few specific events for the two newest cohorts who were denied a meetup due to the pandemic. Um, thankfully, now with reopening, we ought to be able to make that happen in this next year. So we're really excited about that. But in the meantime, there's a lot we can do with one another online. And so this is the third and the final of the series in the spring. And we are calling it the new entrepreneur because um, entrepreneurship really is coming in a lot of different forms these days. People are using entrepreneurship very strategically in order to um, advance other objectives. And I think we have to take a broad view of what's possible with entrepreneurship, because if we don't, if we always hold as the ideal, uh, a, a big economic win, highly scalable venture, you know, venture backed entity, um, uh, all the things that uh, those venture capitalists would come to campus and be very judgy about the kinds of ventures that we cared about, then we'll never actually hit our potential, our ideals, our values. And we will um, put in front of ourselves a lot of mental blocks and constructs about what is good enough from a venture creation standpoint. Forget about all that, okay? We need to set new norms. So what we have here for you today are some entrepreneurial stories, a few that you may have previously heard either at a meetup or, or in the online space here, but some that are actually, we haven't even heard. We've only caught wind of. And so we're excited to have them here to be able to um, give us all a two minute hitch of what they did and why you should want to hear them. Okay, here we go. So we're gonna first start with the OG in the room. He was a university innovation fellow before we even had the terminology university innovation fellows, back when it was called the student ambassadors program. Yep. 2010, I think, Kevin. I've got the grace to prove it. I've got the grace <laughs> to prove it. So. Welcome <laughs> back. All right, so we're gonna, um, we're calling you the credit swipe app. Tell us what opportunity you saw and what you did about it. Awesome. So wonderful. Thank you guys so much. Uh, my name is Kev Mobilade. I'm the CEO and co-founder of the company's called Swipe Credit. Um, I built it with our co-founder. He has a PhD background in computer engineering. He's our CTO. So the problem that we're solving is that there's 26 million people in this country that lack access to credit. They're called credit invisible individuals. So we've put together a B2B to C model where we sell it to banks, credit unions, and other financial service organizations to provide credit and, and have a lot of social impact for the individual, but also help the banks and organizations grow their sales. So join my uh, breakout room if you want to learn about figuring out product market fit without breaking the bank, um, go to market strategy and how to sell low ticket and high ticket offers. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, Kevin. Awesome. All right. Next, we're going to hear from someone who founded an accelerator for Black entrepreneurs, Nicole Parker, who is a, a, a fellow from uh, George Mason. Nicole. Hi, it's so great to be here. Thanks for having me. So the problem that I saw was uh, the lack of culturally competent programs to support Black entrepreneurs. So back in my hometown, we my, an organization that I started with my sisters is called Sisters in Business, really supporting Black and Brown women, and then also helped to start an organization called Black Wall Street Kalamazoo, helping to support Black businesses. And in response to COVID, we recognized that a lot of businesses did not have the proper paperwork to pull down resources that were coming out. So we developed a a virtual accelerator. So if you'd like to learn more about how we are supporting Black entrepreneurs and navigating the grassroots space and being able to raise funds and provide pitch dollars for them, please come out to my breakout room. Sweet. Thank you, Nicole. Um, we on, Next on my list is Farming Venture in Cameroon, but I don't think I've seen Roland Fenendrum on the call. Um, Roland was a fellow also back in the student ambassador days and um, and then he moved to, uh, back to his homeland in uh, Cameroon, Africa and started a farming venture. He has tons of greenhouses and, um, and now he's the president at the local college and he's like kicking ass and taking names. You should friend him on Facebook and um, we'll have him back. Um, next up we have um, artificial intelligence startups and actually it's sort of a, a venture uh, angel investor uh, accelerator for AI. So Angelica, tell us more about that. 
Yes, definitely. Hi, everyone. Angelica Willis here. I'm a software engineer and AI researcher at Google. I'm passionate about two things, leveraging AI to enhance the quality and longevity of human life um, and also entrepreneurship. And uh, in my session, I will explore my entrepreneurship journey from the perspective of a, of a journey tree where each branch is kind of a crazy new direction. I've explored in entrepreneurship. I've kind of done it all. I've launched a traditional startup uh, that I co-founded. I started a makerspace. I run an AI, AI consulting firm where I help um, other companies launch AI startups, um, as well as work with Fortune 500 companies. I am an angel investor and also help other angels get involved in, uh, in investing. And um, I also run pitch competitions. So join my session of in, if any of that sounds interesting to you. Angelica is the epitome of just say yes. Uh, and it, 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 uh, I can shout out to Casey for, for her Ignite on that. Um, and I wanna just also give her a shout out because um, she co-taught a mashup of UIF and sort of addressing racism in higher ed. Um, she co-taught a class with me at Stanford last fall called Designing Courageous Conversations for Impact. And we did exactly, we addressed racism at Stanford. It was pretty awesome. Thank you, Angelica. Um, next up, we have um, a fashion designer, not something you typically hear about in the UIF crew, but Sharni Davis has such an incredible story. Um, can you give us like the essence of it in two minutes, Sharni? Good morning, guys. I am so, so, so blessed to be here. Um, thank you, Himera, for bringing me back. Um, I was a fellow in 2017. Um, I graduated from the illustrious Clark Atlanta University with a fashion design and merchandising degree. And from there, I saw a problem. I was blessed with the opportunity to work in New York, um, work with Vogue Italia, work on a Beyonce project. And I was also blessed with the opportunity to study the, excuse me, luxury fashion in Paris, France. However, when I was abroad in Paris, I saw the disconnect from values. I really value companies, but they didn't value me. And so from there, I realized that I have to make a space for who I am and what I value and the different things that I stand on. So I created my own faith-based creative consulting company where I work with multiple different clients um, that need my particular expertise in creativity. So if you wanna learn how to turn your design skills from fashion design, interior design, graphic design into more of a value-based um, component to create funding for yourself as well as for your clients, definitely come within my break-in. Break-in, break. Break-in, we're going to break in, in that break-out. We're going to break in and that break-out, amen. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Charnay. Awesome. You. Um, okay, next up, we have a person uh, who is um, working on import-export. Yumi, tell us about that. And also sort of like doing some other things at the same time, but actually epitomizes the hustle. Tell us. Okay. Thank you, Himura. Hi, everyone. Good to see all of you. Uh, my name is Yumi Liang. Um, my story is about starting a, and running a family business in the import and, uh, import and export industry, specifically with produce and food products. Uh, so it is quite traditional, you know, compared to all the previous fellows um, startups. I'll touch on specifically what it takes to get to traditional industries like import and export, uh, challenges when it comes to working with food in general, and how to navigate their family business. Um, yeah. That's a big one, right? I mean, I, I'm sure that we, yeah, there's there's a number of us, and right, because entrepreneurial people don't fall you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So I'm sure, yes, excellent. Thank you so much, Yumi. I'm excited for you to drop into your session. Um, we also have um, some climate change activists in the room. Um, I think we're all passionate about addressing climate change, but we have some folks who are explicitly working on that. And so we're gonna start with um, Vincent Arena. Vincent, are you out there? Yep. Hi everyone, my name is Vincent. Um, at UIF, I launched an initiative at RPI to help connect students to co-founders, opportunities, and projects. And the goal was to encourage and foster a culture of creativity and innovation on the campus. Um, and after graduating, I've spent the past five years working in a lot of different types of businesses. Uh, so 
opening up two coffee shops and also working on a wholesale distribution business, getting pasta and products into companies like BJ's. Um, and so through the kind of family businesses and then transitioning to working on a cooperation, um, a mutual aid group called Cooperation Long Island, doing um, COVID response work and also volunteering with the United Nations Association. Um, and throughout the last few years, I've also been working on the side to launch kind of my dream social platform, which is now in its alpha called Trove. Um, and it's about connecting people to what matters most to solve um, collective problems like climate change. And the one thing I've learned is um, it's not just about starting companies and solving problems. It's about really being able to look at the big picture systems and um, and ask the hard questions of like, are these problems that I'm solving the root cause? Um, many of us believe we're changing the world when we may instead or also be protecting the, pro the, the systems that are at the root of the problems we actually wish to solve. And so if anyone wants to talk more about the kind of like systemic uh, nature of problems and how we can create regenerative, sustainable, equitable futures with startups and different types of entities like co-ops, um, then jump in my room or jump in Daniel's because he talks about this too. So Vincent introduced me to Winner Takes All. This, um, this is an incredible um, uh, look at how, you know, the Sackler family will make a ton of money and then like fund rehab clinics or the Pepsi family will make a ton of money and then like fund, you know, childhood obesity. Mm, uh, you know, in Congress here. So go see Vincent because he will help you understand sort of larger systemic issues. Next up, another climate change um, angle. And we are going to hear from um, Daniel Kleinman, who's going to tell us how he's tackling uh, this issue through ocean sciences. Thank you. And very appropriate. I did go after Vincent. Uh, you know, so basically for me, I spent the last five plus years in the marine robotics field, but I always had this passion to do innovation and technology for really doing the impactful work. And I got sucked into doing defense work primarily and put on my systems thinking hat and said, what's wrong with the system? And why can't someone who actually has the technical background to do the impactful work have the opportunities? And ultimately it really came down to funding as well as social silos. And so really, you know, when we think about how we approach our fields and how we approach the existing corporate, uh, how I should say, uh, monopolization of a lot of our current uh, fields, you know, it's really about how do we challenge these systems and create alternative pathways. And so my company, Seaworthy Collective, we're a startup community and venture studio, basically democratizing the opportunity for people to do ocean innovation from the ground up, building startups and co-creating them. And so I'll touch on just similar to Vincent, their generative approach, going beyond sustainability to actually solve problems rather than just mitigate them. You know, the approach of actually doing hybrid social impact and for-profit building, and at the same time, really drilling into how we can actually create tangible impact and not just make solutions for the sake of solutions. And I'm based here in Miami, can touch on that too, which it's been crazy here, so. <laughs> thank, thank you, Daniel. Um, speaking of solving problems, we have someone with us who, um, when uh, Haiti was in crisis, um, went down and rolled up her sleeves and also found that everyone else rolling up their sleeves didn't have a way to charge their cell phones and she did something about it. So tell us about that, Connor. Hi, thank you, Humair, and uh, thank you to all you for, for joining this event. Um, I'm a UIF 2014, I think, maybe 2015, I can't really remember at this point. Um, however, uh, like Humair said, the problem I solved was um, a friend of mine actually told me about um, this, this crisis in Haiti where everyone had this energy poverty to charge cell phones. And so um, what I did was I created a solution using a, a few different methodologies um, and found a way to take this idea, turn it into a social venture, but not just a social venture that makes money for the company, but a way to create jobs for the people on the ground, um, not just in Haiti, but all around the world. So we've got our product in 17 countries around the world today. Um, so if you want to know more about social entrepreneurship, um, you know, how to scale a company or product, uh, you know, physical hardware product internationally, um, or even how to pivot during a pandemic, um, or when you see a difference, please join my breakout room and I'd love to discuss more. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. And last but not least, we have someone among us who um, is in the food business. Who doesn't love food? I don't see one hand raised. We all love food. Um, and Enos loved food, lots of different kinds of food and introduced that to his community in a very interesting way. Enos, tell us about that. Hey, thanks so much. 
Uh, yeah, I, I think I was a fellow in 2014 and we, we had this idea to connect people who love to cook with their community in a way that would empower them to make money. So similar to Etsy and Airbnb, where you're giving people the ability to make money on things that they already have, we wanted to make it easy for people to just sell their food. And so we, we called it uh, Giga Munch. It basically started off as uh, finding all these immigrants and, and people who are like making unique foods in our area and trying to make a, a social platform where they can sell their food to people who are interested. Uh, so very much like a, 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 the two platform system. Uh, it, that morphed a lot over the years. We hit legal, uh, legal blocks, we hit investment blocks, and it just changed a lot. And over four or five years of working on it, I learned about marketing, learned about validating your customers, validating assumptions. We made so many bad assumptions about what we thought people would want, and we kept learning the hard way. And so if you want to uh, learn about how to validate your idea, how to validate your product before you launch. Um, I'd love to share about that. Uh, we did end up selling it. Uh, it was not a huge, big victory sale. It was more of a, we ran out of funds and we sold it at a break even just to pay back the investors and sort of end, end the thing as, um, as best as we could. So if you want to learn about selling, even if you think it's not ready to be sold, I'd love to share about that. Um, and then also from there, I ended up working on a project that's actually in the mental health space and mainly because I was inspired by the amount of stress and anxiety that was experienced during the, in the giga Munch years, it kind of showed me that, you know, it's not worth it if you're stressed out and anxious and you start to kind of hate what you do. And so if you'd like to hear about managing anxiety, managing stress and, being your best self at these important presentations, being uh, able to enjoy what you do and not let the, the pressure get to you. I'd love to talk to you about that as well. So uh, see you soon if you like. Thank you, Ines. And also, you know, you've got a thing for servant leadership, a specific style of empowering others. And so note to self for those who are interested in that. Um, clearly, you're gonna wanna talk with your one another as well. And we wanna make that opportunity available to you. So just as a reminder, and especially for those who came late, we're going to have 20 minutes of um, breakout session on conferency. So you're gonna to walk to the session that you'd like. If you have trouble getting there, we can assign you. And then at that 20 minute mark, we'll um, send you a um, reminder into your breakout that says you can switch if you want, you can stay if you want. If you're the speaker in one room, you could choose to join another room, maybe bring your people, perhaps the discussion morphs and goes in a different direction. I'm gonna let you all figure it out. I'd like the, um, the speakers to, um, the invited guests to be the leaders, but if they leave, assign a leader. Um, and then whoever has been assigned a leader, consider yourself the person who will report out at the end, when we talk about some of the key takeaways. Um, this is rich, it's gonna help inform what you all need. So um, make sure to sort of like capture some key takeaways. We didn't share a doc or anything like that, but just jot them down and, and bring them in, and you can say them out loud. All right, welcome back everyone. I think I had a chance to attend almost every session. And wow, what an incredible group we have here of um, presenters and listeners and contributors. Thank you, everyone. Um, we're just gonna take this next short while to, um, to recap what happened. We're all excited. Not everyone had a chance to hop into your session. So um, guest speakers, if um, I'm gonna sort of call out each group and um, maybe you could give like a one minute encapsulation of kind of the things that you heard from the participants who came to your session. Um, and so we'll first ask from the guest speakers and then we'll turn it to everyone else and, and augment with your perspectives on what you thought was very um, helpful or how you'd love to, um, wh where you'd love to take your thinking next about entrepreneurship and these, the different ways we can put our entrepreneurial uh, mindset into the world. So let's first start with, uh, uh, let's go in the same order. All right, credit swipe app, Kevin. Right, so um, main takeaway was uh, product market fit. So 
uh, we, we, have a, we have a framework that we call the ATM method. So who is your audience? Who are you selling to? What transformation are you creating for them? And do these two activities before you build anything. Don't waste your time writing code. Audience is either yourself, because you live with yourself every day, you know your problems, you've solved that for yourself. Find other people that are like you, sell that to them. Or your domain expertise where you worked for 10 years, what problems are in your domain, build that, sell that to them. So we kind of focus on the proper approach of finding product market fit that will save you a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of pain um, before you build the mechanism. So that's what we went over. Okay, this, what you're all hearing right now, truth. It took me so long to figure that out, to, to realize that, much later in life than necessary. I see some nodding heads. Um, so if you have not yet wrapped your mind around those concepts, go learn about product market fit and what Kevin describes. Thank you, Kevin. Um, we're going to um, jump next to um, the Venture Accelerator for Black Entrepreneurs. Let's hear from Nicole. Hi. We had a great conversation, a lot of good questions. Um, one of the things that came, definitely came up was how to uh, create a um, culturally competent program. And one of the things we really talked about was making sure when you are developing your program that you have representation. Um, and it's key and critical that you have those voices and people are reflective of, of the culture and the people that you are trying to impact. Um, in addition to that, we talked about putting a timeline in place and being realistic about being able to go after funding and not being afraid to approach your um, local foundations um, to have those critical conversations. And within the university, making sure that your curriculum is reflective, even if you are going through and saying, what books are we reading? Who, um, who are we putting in front of? of our uh, students when we're talking about shaping the minds of potential business owners. So definitely that representation timeline and not being afraid of asking what you need. Yeah, and that's something, you know, mostly our conversation today has been centered on uh, our entrepreneurial interests. But when you think about your UIF work on campus, when, you know, there are a lot of people of color we're leaving behind in our entrepreneurship programs. Let's face it, right? Look at the demographics of people who come through our doors. So um, what Nicole speaks is truth and like really culturally competent um, on, uh, entrepreneurship programs and also representation. Uh, that in and of itself is a valiant UIF goal to pursue for this next year. So think about that. Um, next, uh, we are going to um, talk about our AI. So um, Angelica, tell us about uh, your breakout. Yeah, definitely. So we had a great meta conversation around um, my my journey through entrepreneurship and kind of all the crazy ways that I've applied my entrepreneurial mindset and what I call like an entrepreneurial way of life um, and exploring different ways of adding value. Um, we talked about opportunity costs of, of um, you know, exploring this this one thing that we're super passionate about when we have all these other passions, I can definitely relate to that. Um, and, you know, how do we make those choices? Um, and how do we, you know, um, how do we wait our time and apply our time in, in creative ways um, to the specific things that interest us uh, in, a, in a way that doesn't really take away from our overall goal? Um, we also talked about, um, you know, this perspective of a non technical. Um, founder um, building very technical or maybe AI based uh, products. Um, that's I'm very passionate about um, non technical founders launching companies and, and not getting into this sort of chicken and egg scenario where it's hard for them to progress and raise capital because they don't have strong technical talent, but it's hard for them to get strong technical talent because they haven't raised any money or have any progress yet. So we talked about that a little bit as well. Um, that's awesome. And I just, I want to build a little bit on something that Angelica said, because um, I mentioned earlier, Angelica is like the epitome of just say yes. Um, and sometimes you have to be judicious, but I have to say that um, what I love about Angelica is that she is a female who espouses just say yes. And, and that's not to say that there aren't other females that do, but in my mind, even amongst fellows who are inclined to take on things that are ambiguous and new, um, my ladies are much less apt to come out and say yes and take on uh, just 
a, you know, um, just a little bit more indifferent. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just challenge the ladies in the group to think about that in, as it relates to their lives. Um, and, and, but urge everyone to, to really think about saying, saying yes more. Um, and even if it's, you're not doing it perfect, um, but it'll expose you to so many things. And the little thing that you do here that's not perfect is going to make this thing really come to life. It's, there's no other way I can describe it to you, but the ripple effect that it can have on all the opportunities that you're involved in. I'll just put it, put that out there. And, and that's, that's a whole nother session, I'll tell you. Um, okay, next up, fashion design. Um, let's turn to Sharnay Davis. Sharnay. Um, we've had a really, really, really interesting breakout session. We really just started about speaking about my process and my journey to where I am now. Um, but most importantly, we spoke about owning your confidence and being confident in who you are, being confident in what you decide to wear. Um, and then we started talking about more um, when it comes to having an idea and pursuing that idea. And we end it with um, just kind of finding value and understanding how, you know, even though you value something, you can stand firm on that. You don't have to conform to a company that you might want to work with um, just because they might be paying more money or just because this is a more of a, a Fortune 500 company. You do have the freedom to still be who you are and still stand on your values without compromising who you are. So that's what we spoke about. I love that. And, you know, uh, if you all are interested in a longer version of Sharnay uh, Davis's uh, story, uh, ping me because there are some awesome interviews that one fellow did of uh, another fellow, Charnay, um, that goes into greater depth. And one thing that really strikes me is the um, how confidence, you, you have to have it and you just have to maintain it because a lot of people can be threatened by your confidence. And Charnay has seen that firsthand, but like sticking to your values and being values driven, um, no one should be taking away your confidence, period, period. <laughs> um, and, and so I love what you, um, are do, breaking out on your own and, and doing because it, it will pay off for you in spades. Thank you, Sharnay. Thank you. All right. Um, next up import export. I think Yumi had to leave. Is that true? <gasps> Yumi, you're here. I'm so glad you're here. Tell us, um, what happened in your breakout? Uh, I just rescheduled my, my meeting afterwards so I could stay with you guys. Um, yeah, so, uh, quick takeaway. Um, so, very often time people find it like super overwhelming and very complex when it comes to import export logistics. Um, but I, I will always give this advice to any new um, people that want to join this industry is like, um, go talk to your customer. Like you'll quickly learn almost everything you need to learn because they're gonna share with you exactly what their problems are. They're gonna tell you exactly what vendors are using. They'll tell you all the vendors, like suppliers, everything that you need to know. To know like you're gonna find your competitors, you're gonna find out oh, um, oh, who are the vendors that I, I you need to use yourself. Um, so go talk to your, your customers. You're gonna learn a lot about what you need to know about business to get started. Um, and that's the biggest takeaway. Awesome. Thank you, Yumi. Um, a lot of us have relationships in multiple countries and import export is such an incredible way to take advantage of some of those uh, relationships. But like uh, Yumi, you bring us back to uh, some of the fundamentals of uh, entrepreneurship uh, right next to product market fit is, you know, being there with your customer and, and like your customer will tell you everything you need to know. Um, thank you for that. Um, okay, uh, we have next um, our climate change colleagues. Uh, so let's start with Vincent. Thanks, Yumara. Uh, we had a really great discussion, uh, yeah, kind of around this topic of the new, new entrepreneur, um, that entrepreneurs are going to need new norms, new social norms, um, to not be the kind of hero to save the world, but to think about how to exist in larger ecosystems of solutions and how to collaborate with other startups and how to create, um, you know, really um, new kind of models for us to be able, instead of kind of competing to solve problems like climate change, how do we actually like coordinate our action together and, and rethink the way that we're organizing ourselves. Um, so we talked about like, you know, going from beyond sharing resources to like trust and values 
and how that's like a really important piece, foundational piece for collaboration to happen is like making sure people have this, you know, know what their values are and are, are collaborating with people that have shared values and have a shared end goal and way to get there. Um, and then we also just talked about some really like big picture problems like, um, you know, how we need to move from the kind of economic growth model to like being more efficient. So instead of trying to compete to outgrow each other, how can we compete to see who could have the most efficient use of our resources? So how do we do more with less, which is something that um, Buckminster Fuller talks about um, a lot in, in his like design science. Um, and um, yeah, I guess the last thing was we talked about education and how like, you know, we need to try to figure out how we align our education system so that we can kind of kill two birds with one stone. We can teach people to think in systems and solve problems and build on each other's past projects instead of just kind of restarting the wheel each time and duplicating our efforts. Um, and so, yeah, like kind of bringing in the humility that's like, you are where you are because you, of all of what has come before you. And it's, it's kind of silly to think that, you know, you created this thing yourself alone. It's been your family. It's been your teachers. It's been your community that's built you up. And so we're interconnected and a part of these like broader systems and like seeing that is really important to having humility as an entrepreneur. I couldn't agree with you more, Vincent. Um, recently, Lori asked our uh, UIF staff team uh, if at our, at our Tuesday morning check-ins, um, if, if you could um, uh, just change your career and do anything else, what would it be? And I responded that I would be a historian. Uh, because I, I've learned, I've learned now that there is so much that has come before us, and if only I knew what came before us, I could have started doing the doing the more right things sooner in life. And uh, I don't, I don't, I think we've given short shrift to our history. So what you what you say, I it really resonates with me, and I think um, it is, is this arrogant individualistic entrepreneurial thing of like, I can do it alone and no one's done it before me. And, you know, but like, thank you for reminding us, uh, no, everybody's done it before you and you are connected and uh, we're, we're all in this together. Um, Daniel. Well, speaking of the collectivist approach, uh, so basically, you know, what we're, what we talked about, you know, I, I of course covered my journey, uh, but more importantly, really open people's minds to challenging silos and siloed thinking, right? Um, Nicholas, who I know how to jump off, you know, mentioned he's an electrical engineer and he's interested in the oceans. So does he have to switch majors to environmental engineering? And it's like, no, all you have to do is focus the application of what you're doing rather than thinking you have to have this degree to be in this field, right? And so um, I elaborated further actually when I jumped into Vincent room, Vincent's room as well, um, you know, this notion that we need more interdisciplinary collaboration and radical collaboration at that, right? Uh, when we think about what it's going to take to actually solve all these problems. I mean, first off, it's not even actually innovation, it's more implementation. But more importantly, it's really overcoming a lot of the socially constructed silos of, you know, in my field specifically, people in academia thinking public sector and academia not even thinking about entrepreneurship and innovation. And then people in tech not even realizing they can do things outside of aerospace. And so it's really, you know, breaking down these, these artificial barriers that have prevented us from, from developing the solutions that we actually need to address the big problems of our time. And more importantly, to stop serving the private interests that are just profiting off exploitation and militarization and actually start addressing the problems that can serve everybody. Thank you for that. I mean, as much as we love academia and we are invested as UIF in helping academia improve, it is a capitalistic system that exists to give you a degree and tell you you're certified to go do this now. Right, I'm, I've been working on DEI stuff for the last year. I just learned there's a DEI certificate at Cornell. I'm not gonna go do that, but the, that might stop someone from actually jumping in like I did. And, and so, you know, what you say is, is truth. I mean, I was a math major. How many of you conversations have I had with each one of you with an understanding of, you know, your space and, and helping cross pollinate? So, uh, yes. Um, and I'll just add, you don't are. need an M MBA to be an entrepreneur either. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Daniel. Um, okay, jumping next to um, solar charging for disaster relief. Thank you, Kamir. Uh, I mean, we had a, a great conversation. We had quite a few people coming in and out. And so we had multiple conversations overlapping. We talked about everything from uh, product development, uh, relationships, you know, building those relationships to be able to, to move a product forward, 
uh, business model design, SWOT analysis. Um, we, we talked about a lot of different things. And I think some of the, the biggest takeaways, two of them that stand out to me is, you know, going back to, to Humira, what you just said, if, if you're not talking to the clients, and if you're not solving a problem for the clients, then you're creating a problem for the clients. Um, whether that's a behavior problem, whether that's a, a change or an adaptation to what they're currently doing, if you're not solving it, you're, you're creating a new problem. Uh, and then the second thing, just personally for me, I, I didn't mention this to anybody in my groups, but one of the biggest takeaways for me is, is how important these types of gatherings are for an entrepreneur. Um, because, you know, even though not all of us can take the same collective approach that Vincent and Daniel has done, um, some of us kind of feel like we're out on an island at some points and to be around like-minded individuals who have passion, you know, that's contagious. And so, um, you know, that's why these types of things are important because you, you get to talk to people, you get to have questions, you know, questions that people probably haven't asked you in a long time, but you know, something that's really important to you. Um, and so, you know, that's, that was a big takeaway for me personally is how important um, it is to regroup with people who are as passionate as you are. To help you reframe and rethink and question every, all of your assumptions and, and like restart anew. Um, Thank you for that, that you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and last but not least, um, uh, ethnic food um, meal share membership. I, I know there's an easier way to say that, Ines. And in fact, you came up with one, um, which was the name of your company, but tell me again what that was. And you're on mute. Yeah, Gigamunch was just uh, Gigamunch. the name of the company. Yep, yep. But um, we had a lot of conversations that ranged from that, you know, the, the, food sharing idea to uh, mental health in the workforce and in your own life. Uh, one of the big things that came up was shiny object syndrome, where as entrepreneurs, you're like very inspired, very excited, very um, willing to do things and say yes and, and go out and try everything. And there's also a, if you're first starting out, there's a pressure to succeed fast. And so when you combine that, you get a lot of shiny object syndrome where everything, you know, the local entrepreneur networking event and the, the local pitch competition and the, and the, this event and that event and uh, all the stuff that's happening in your city and, and all the meetings and investor pitches and all the networking things. It's like, there's a lot of time spent in the beginning on stuff that in my opinion, at least is like, you really just need to go talk to your customer more and, and, and not only talk to them, but then ask them to be a customer, an actual customer. Like, and that was a big thing that we talked about too, was uh, you don't have to build your product before getting your first customer. You can go out and talk to a hundred people, and if 10 of those 100 people say they really like your idea, one of them should really realistically give you a $10 bill to say like, I'd like to reserve my spot or I'd like to donate or I'd like to support this financially. Um, and if you're not getting any of that, if you're not, if you're genuinely, if you talk to 100 people and not a single person is like willing to give you a dollar, it, then maybe they're just being nice. So it's, it's like keeping that in mind in the beginning, when you're just starting out, you really don't need to be focused on a thousand different things. It's really just about getting 10 people to give you $10 each so that you know, this is a good idea. And here's an example of 10 actual customers. And then from there, things become a lot more clear. I, um, I will be using that shiny object syndrome. I, I definitely uh, suffer from a little bit of that. Uh, it's, a, it's sort of like the counterpart to just say yes. The, you know, you're saying yes to a lot of shiny objects and some things you know, work and some things don't. But, um, but the mental health thing is real. You know, that's the thing, Even, no matter how confident or how successful, you know, you have a view of the world and what could be that is different from what is. So, you know, it takes a lot of effort to you know, muster up that vision every day and that strength every day. And sometimes you fall short and, um, you know, it's, it's a thing amongst our community of entrepreneurially mindsetted people or entrepreneurship people. So thank you for that. 
Um, okay, I think we made our way through all the guests. Um, in our, you know, last few minutes, um, we want to hear from everyone else in short, sort of like tweet sized takeaways slash what else do you need to do your UIF work well and to do your entrepreneurial work well. Um, and then we're going to take that till about 1157. So four minutes. Just go ahead and take yourself off mute. We're a small enough group. We're a community that cares. So just jump, jump in. More of this, says Tomo. Yeah, okay. Definitely. I mean, yeah, more of this. That's easy enough. Marcella agrees. Prototyping, customer validation. All right, Felipe. Love how many faculty champions were in this group. Shout out to all of you. Felipe agrees. I'm just inspired by how directly UIF and all of you are tackling issues of race, inequality, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, it's frankly inspiring. And thank you, everybody, so much. Yeah, thank you um, to all of our guests. Um, we, we were especially interested in recruiting a different kind of entrepreneurial perspective this time around. I mean, we've done our own personal soul searching and organizational soul searching. For those who haven't seen our latest blog post, we, we undertook some research about the, um, the experience of Black students in our program and how UIF have, has fallen short of um, what it could be in part because, well, history and complete lack of understanding of the last 400 years of history. And anyways, um, so much more that, that we can do together. Um, so I'm excited about that future. Um, blog post, yes. Um, what others, feel free to again, take yourself off mute and We have some shout out to the presenters and their honesty. Yeah, someone asked, can we like record the breakout sessions? And we decided, you know, some gloves off, you know, just talking frankly is, is needed. And we decided, decided against that. All right, any, any last call for, for comments or thoughts? Okay, terrific. So what we're gonna do uh, in this very final, final few moments is, um, as you know, we believe feedback is a gift. And we, um, you gave us some feedback right now, but also we want you to put it in a very short survey. So my colleague Ganesham is gonna drop a link in the chat window and I'm gonna play um, a little bit of fun music. Um, and I'm gonna give you three minutes to do it. We're gonna then take a selfie to memorialize this moment, and then we will release you. So go ahead and, and take a moment to complete that uh, chat, that um, form please. And also we welcome our guests to also uh, complete that. Okay. Um, we are at the final minute. It's 12 o'clock. Actually, we're at 12 o'clock. So we're going to take a quick selfie. Um, and uh, let's see, what's the right, uh, what's the right pose, Lori? What do you say? Entrepreneurship. Hmm. Oh, strength. strength. <gasps> yes. Daniel. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. We said the same thing at the same time. Okay. Okay. Show us your favorite strength pose, muscles, brains, whatever you think represents your strength. Show it to us and I'll take a picture. Ready? Good sit for the win. One, two, three, smile. That's amazing. You're all fabulous. You're all so Thank strong. you. Ever. We are. We are the epitome of strength. All right. Love you all. Thank you so much for being here. So great to see you. We'll see you again soon. And thank you so much to all the speakers. Thank you, Himera and Lori, for putting this together. And thank you for inviting us. Thank yes, you, ladies. Thank you, team. See ya. Um, See ya, everybody. Thanks thank so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.